I'm Derek Jensen. This is Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network. My guest today is Trista Hendren. She's the author of the Girl God series. You can read more about her projects at www.thegirlgod.com. So first, thank you for your work, and second, thank you for being on the program. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so for readers who don't know, what is the Girl God and um, the, the book, and uh, how and why did you write it? Okay, well, um, basically I was raised really fundamentalist Christian and kind of came into feminism through college and whatnot. Um, I kind of became pretty comatose with my feminism when I had my kids. I was just kind of the normal mom doing mom things. Um, I had a son first and then I had my daughter. And when I had my daughter, it kind of woke me up considerably because I realized that I didn't want her to live the same life that I had lived. Um, so I tried to start doing things differently with both my children. Um, but one of the things that really got to me is uh, my daughter had asked me one day about, uh, we were talking about God, and she couldn't identify with a male God whatsoever. I mean, it was just like completely insane to her. So I, I said, you know, what about a girl God? And then she lit up, you know, and all her you know, possibilities sort of expanded. So we kind of had this conversation around this, and um, and I ended up writing the book around that. It's actually a children's book, um, but a lot of women have actually used it for therapy and whatnot just to kind of undo the socialization of God being male because it really has a very negative impact on women. What, what do you think some of the impacts on women are from having a primary male deity? Well, it basically puts all the, the it, it legitimizes male power. So basically, even if you're not religious, all of our institutions are based on religion for the most part. So it's kind of top down, takes away the power from women and girls and says, you know, give everything to the men um, in your lives and let them take charge. And I'm thinking, um, one of the things I'm thinking, and I'm sure you can list a bazillion other things that this happens with, but I know that when Peggy Reeve Sanday was describing the, um, she did a study of why some cultures are high rape cultures and some cultures mm -hmm. are low rape cultures. And one of the markers of a high rape culture is a primary uh, male creator deity as opposed to either mm -hmm. a partner or a woman. So I think, I mean, when I first read that, I don't know, 20, 25 years ago, it it didn't surprise me in one sense, but in another, in another sense, I'd never thought of that before. So can you say some of the other perhaps social implications of a male creator deity that people might not think about? Well, yeah, I mean, certainly there's rape. I mean, any anytime you look at fundamentalist um, families, you have a lot more incest, you have rape. Um, I think just the male entitlement issues, uh, especially, you know, within the home, you know, the father becomes God and it sets up the whole family in that dynamic of what the man says goes and that sets up women for domestic violence, rape, uh, verbal abuse, financial abuse, so many different things. I mean, there's really nothing positive for women in a male God. Um, I mean, I know some people do feel like they get a benefit from church or the mosque or whatever, you know, that, that sense of community. But really, for the most part, it's a, it's a further indoctrination of being submissive, passive, um, and accepting a lesser status. And what, what, I mean, I know that you have not been able to, um, you know, somehow you've not been able to uh, completely transform Abrahamic religions through your one book. I mean, I don't, I can't imagine how we've not been able to make that happen just through your book. But um, what have been some of the effects on, I'm thinking specifically of your daughter, but also other people closer to you and other people who read the books, what are some of the effects on girls of um, encountering the notion of a girl god and being taught it and or embracing it? Well, I have seen a lot of 
I mean, not necessarily from my book uh, specifically, but I, I do see that there's a shift happening, especially once I, I think I started this publicly like four years ago. There's def definitely a shift from when I started that people thought I was completely nuts, although this is not a new idea. I mean, there's a, a lot of women and men that have, have done this work for a long time. Um, but I would say on a personal level, you know, with my daughter, she believes she's a goddess, you know? I mean, I, I shifted because when I grew up, I was always, my sisters, I have three sisters, we were all brought up to believe we were princesses, which now I kind of see as really disempowering, you know, because it's putting you into this place where if you're good and you do all the right things and you're pretty and you, you know, wait for the prince, then your life will turn out great, which doesn't happen. It didn't happen for me, that's for sure. But what I now do when someone calls my daughter a princess is I say, no, she's a goddess. And she fully believes that. She also believes she's a witch. And she really is in control of her own um, surroundings. I mean, of course, that won't probably always be the case. Actually, she just walked in as a girl who's like growing up in this world because it's a, not a female-friendly world. But, um, but she's a very strong, independent um, little girl. I mean, she's nine years old, but she, she feels very free and confident to say exactly what she thinks to anyone. So, I think, so can you validate for, can we jump to sort of the larger picture of what, um, what does it mean to, to, what, what are some of the larger, living within a patriarchal culture with, with this, um, you know, patriarchal sky god out there, can you just get really basic about what are some of the effects of that on the raising of girls, and what does that what does that mean? And and just presume, um, presume that a lot of like presume you were talking to a person who was uh, trained into it as you were at 15 or 16. What how would you start laying seeds, and what would you say to how how would you start outlining the training that they have undergone? To them well you know I think that um, growing up as a girl and, and see I grew up really fundamentalist so I I have a pretty extreme experience but I will say even with my daughter raising her with this uh, framework of that God is a girl that she's had a lot of resistance you know when she was in first and second grade um, boys are already asserting this on the playground and saying you know uh, you know, basically, I'm cool because God is a boy or whatever. I mean, I'm kind of making it very simple. But my daughter has had these very specific arguments with little boys who were very convinced that God is a man and that kind of puts this, them in this higher position, uh, which is interesting because none of these um, boys are particularly religious, but that's kind of the framework that American culture is coming from. Now I'm in Norway, but um, so it's a little bit different here. But I would say America is particularly bad about even if you're not necessarily going to church every Sunday or active in your faith, there's still kind of this notion that God is male. And to me, it kind of seeps into everything. And, and what I'm trying to get at are what, are what are some of the tangible effects of this? What does, that, what does that end up doing? I'm thinking about this line that I read, not having anything to do with religion, Mm -hmm. about, um, I read this probably 25, 30 years ago in some book about teaching gifted children and how children will uh, respond to um, what society rewards them for. And there was this great line about how if you ask a little second grade girl or first grade girl to do a math problem, she will, she can do it if she likes math. And if you ask the same thing of a fourth or fifth grade girl, she might turn her pretty head to the side and say, I don't know, mm -hmm. because that's what she's been taught to, that's what that's what she has been, been socially rewarded for doing. Right, yeah, I mean, girls are really indoctrinated to be passive and to pretend to be less than they are. And, you know, depending on which study you read, it depends on at what point that happens, but it's definitely some point during girlhood or several points that, girls are kind of 
what I would consider smack down, you know, to be, uh, the focus is on being pretty, being pleasing, and um, to me, all of that relates into this idea of a male god, but in terms of the effects on women as they get older, it affects everything, because it also puts you in this position, you know, financially, I think that's one of the major gaps for women, obviously, the pay gap, but, you know, just this idea that women's work isn't valuable, and, you know, this whole hierarchy that is set up from our childhood of, you know, women are subservient and men are on top, sets women up for a lifetime of economic destruction and poverty, really. Which can also lead them to lifetimes of abuse, since one of the right. first things that any abuser will do is attempt to, and this is true on the capitalist level too, is attempt to make um, those they're going to abuse financially dependent upon them. Yes, definitely. Well, and then you also have the churches and whatever religious organizations asking for money. So, I mean, I've written about this also, that women should stop giving money to these organizations until women are given a better position within the organizations of equal, you know, not subservient. So I want to, to read back to you one of the quotes from The Girl God. It's by Virginia Woolf. The, mm -hmm. I, the, eyes of others are, are pr the eyes of others are prisons, their thoughts are cages. So can you explain, I'm guessing you don't have to explain that to a lot of women, but can you explain that to a, um, a sympathetic male, what that means and what that's like? Well... I wasn't thinking about this particularly when I put in when I put it into the book, but what I'm thinking about now, particularly with what we're talking about and with a lot of women that grow up with this idea of being this, you know, what Patricia Lynn Watt Riley, who's a big inspiration of mine, called the formula female, of you know, this pretty package, ornamental, being what men want um, want us to be. Um, and it is. It's like being putting yourself in a prison. If you if you live your life to um, please everyone else, which is what I think a lot of women are are socialized to do from birth, um, you are essentially a caged bird. And what? And can you can you go on about that more? Can you can you talk more about that, please? Well, um, there's another quote in there from Rita Mae Brown that says the, re the reward for conformity is everyone likes you except for yourself. Um, and I think I think some of these quotes go along together, and I I think it kind of plays into um, at least what I felt, and I think a lot of women that I know feel this way also that you grow up as a girl and it's it's all about conforming and being what everyone else wants you to be and caretaking and you know especially this this idea of how you look is the most important attribute of a female um, so I think it's really important to give girls a different message and, and I feel like we need to do that earlier because it's, you know we have feminism but it seems like for the most part, it really isn't touching the lives of young girls. You know, we have programs for girls, we have empowerment programs, but they don't really kind of get to the root of what's wrong, in my opinion. And um, until we do that, to me, we're just kind of like churning our wheels. Um, so what, what are the roots of what's wrong? Well, to me, it's religion for the, I mean, I hate to say that because I'm not, I'm not anti-religion. Um, I think that most people um, will retain whatever religion that they were born into, and you know, so if you're born Christian, you're probably going to stay Christian. If you're born Muslim, you're probably going to stay Muslim. Um, I don't see that necessarily as a problem, but I do think that we need reform within the religion, and um, and to me, the root is is there. Um, and, and you have a lot of women doing that work from within. I don't think it's necessarily helpful. Like, um, I have a Christian and a Muslim background, so I don't think it's necessarily helpful 
particularly with Islam, for other people to come in and say, oh, you know, Muslims are bad and you should do this, that, and the other. But I think women within these faith traditions can play a, a role in reforming them. Um, and like for me, when I, when I began studying this, particularly with Islam, I didn't really think that there probably was any divine feminine in Islam, although I hoped that there was. And then the further that I dug into it, the more I found that actually the, the divine feminine has been in basically all the religions, it's just been suppressed. So a lot of even what we consider uh, Islam or Christianity isn't really at the root of what, what, is, what is there, but I would consider now to be like the core of those religions. So how did, um, how, what forms has that suppression taken over the millennia? Well, I think it's been particularly bad with Christianity, but um, in terms of, you know, I mean, killing witches and um, turning Mary Magdalene into a prostitute and, you know, I mean, just really demonizing the divine feminine. Um, I think that it's become like a, a heresy or a, you know, really bad thing to, to talk about the goddess. But I mean, the goddess preceded God. So um, it's sort of an interesting dynamic to me. Um, and it's kind of gone along all the faith traditions. But it's, I think Merlin Stone was the one who said women's rights eroded when they got rid of women's rights, which are, you know, the goddess tradition. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about how some of the um, foundational stories are um, are women hating? Like you tell, you do a retelling in some ways of the the story of um, Adam and Eve and the mm -hmm. the, the forbidden fruit. Mm -hmm. And so, can you talk about? Um, just give one or two of those of those uh, religious stories and show how they are um, training people to training women to be subservient, and then tell that story again in a way that would be not that would be training training to 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 a different social end. Well, the the story of Adam and Eve is interesting because there's actually two different versions for the story in the Bible itself, and and one is kinder to women than the other. And you know, in my uh, Tell Me Why, which is the book that I did for boys, I wrote it for my son specifically. Actually, I did do kind of a twist on that, but I kind of made it my own story. Um, I, I I can't really speak as a religious person because I. I'm not. I, mean, I grew up knowing all these stories. I was very, very religious as a, uh, especially as a teenager. Um, and I, I like read the Bible for hours every day and prayed. And I mean, I was crazy religious. I went to church every day. But um, so now I, I, and I actually went to school to become a minister in Southern Baptist uh, College. Um, so when I did that, I actually became an atheist. And then I became a Muslim, so I kind of have this very strange faith background. Um, I think in telling that story, I don't know if there's a way to make it like from the Bible, uh, um, a friendly story towards women. That's kind of why I redid it myself. Um, I would say the same for most of the stories in the Bible. I think that um, particularly with um, like Mary's story, um, she's very passive and you know I mean I've, I've heard it retold in, in feminist versions where she's basically raped by God so I don't for me that's not really a good story to um, I don't know I don't know if I can retell any 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 stories from the Bible and make them positive for girls I'd have to think about that more I think we have to start telling our own stories So um, I'm thinking of of some of the stories, like um, not from the the Christian tradition, but I'm thinking one of the stories that always comes to mind is uh, like Jason killing the Medusa, and 
there are a lot of stories. It, I guess what I'm trying to get at is it really uh, shifted a lot of my understanding of how we read mythology when I came across some writers like Mary Daly or Jane Caputi who mm -hmm. um, were putting a lot of those mythological stories. I, when I was in high school, I just read those. The, the, they were taught to me as basically just stories. They didn't talk right. about the sociological or political implications. And then right. I read Mary Daly uh, yeah. and um, Jane Caputi and some others who were pointing out that, that like the story of Jason is Jason and the Argonauts killing the Medusa is Jason killing her is really a patriarchal god killing off a wise woman killing off killing off the divine feminine yeah and so we it seems that we see we have a whole lot of that going on in those um it doesn't matter whether it's the the Abra abrahamic religions or whether it's also the the, the other are often just as bad that's why i think you know we kind of have to recreate our own stories because you know i mean basically what you see is a familiar theme in all of them is killing the goddess and um you know, when you do that, you're you're disempowering women also. I mean, women need, I think men need the divine feminine also, but women really need that um, spiritual connection that, you know, a God that looks like them, not a God that is somebody else. You know, I think we all need, um, I think Alice Walker said, the God of woman is autonomy. I think we need uh, our own stories, our own um, reinterpretation of things. And, you know, different women have different roles. I mean, some women want to work within the faith traditions that they're in and um, change those. Other women, you know, Mary Daly and Jane Caputi, I would put more in that category of really kind of <laughs> plowing through them and saying, you know, this is nonsense. So I, I think it's all fantastic. I just think women need to have more avenues to do that and and even within the faith traditions just more ability to question and especially the all-male leadership because also when god is male you have you know look at the catholic church or you know any mosque you don't go to pretty much it's, it's a male imam you don't have women leading hardly ever and of course that affects the everyday decisions of women's lives you know when you get into abortion or other things and you have all men deciding what is moral you come up with different decisions you have abortion is wrong but it's fine to go and go to war and kill millions of people so what was the quote by alice walker that you read again a moment ago um i think it was i didn't read it i just <laughs> i was off the top of my head so I, I think it was the god of yeah the god of woman is autonomy and can you can you explicate that more? Can you? And I know we're covering some pretty basic ground, but I, it just you know when I look around, I see so much hatred of women in the culture at large. I see so much, um, I see so much reinforcement of, you know, woman as adornment as opposed to woman as person herself, that it seems like we really have to, um, get. In order to fight that, it seems we have to be, we have to just say things, even if it seems like they're obvious to us, we still have to explain them. So can you, can you um, explain that statement a bit more and, and make it more clear to, especially young women? Sure, yeah, I mean, it's her statement, but I, I would say for women, you know, to me, that's one of the most important things, because I think most women and I would say even a lot of feminist women don't really have full autonomy in their own lives. They don't really have um, the ability to do what they want and, you know, have their own space in their house and periods of time where they're not caretaking or, uh, you know, I think I see a lot of younger women just spending hours and hours a day on makeup and hair and, you know, you don't see men doing that. At anywhere, I mean, uh, it it just amounts for a very different type of life, and um, I think it's really hard because you're socialized a certain way, and you 
have a certain set of values that are sort of drilled into you. And then I feel like for women, I mean, one of the reasons I wanted to do books for children is that I felt like I've spent my, spent my entire life undoing the damage that, you know, patriarchy um, and very religious um, systems have done to me. So it's, it's kind of like you have to rework your brain. And, um, and I think even women working with other women, you know, I see a lot of uh, arguments and I don't know. I mean, we just kind of have a mess. So I think we have to undo what's been done to women, but I think we also have to raise a future generation of girls that are able to be autonomous and don't have to spend their entire lives undoing what, what they've been taught. A couple things. One is I think about, I sometimes think about a, a person that I knew, I had a student when I was teaching at Eastern Washington University. I had a student who was in her early 20s and she was dating someone who was not very good for her and um, one of the reasons that she didn't want to break up with him, she's like 20 years old or something, and she didn't want to break up with him is because she was afraid that when she was 60 she would be alone. Mm -hmm. And I know that that is a huge both curse that is thrown at women you're going to be a lonely old woman. And I know that that is also a fear that is raised through this. If you're dependent well, upon a man, you can have to put up with a lot of crap you wouldn't otherwise because of this fear. Oh. Go ahead. Well, I mean, it's actually a very uh, honest concern because you have, even in the United States, it's something like 70% of American women retire in poverty. Um, and it's because they are without men and because of the, the pay gap and then not only that, but it accumulates, you know, with uh, in my former life, I was a mortgage broker. So, you know, when you look at women not being able to contribute to a retirement account because they're spending years raising children and then, you know, being paid, you know, if they're lucky, 70 cents on the dollar, um, over time, that really adds up. So, and then, of course, you know, we have this mentality of, you know, women are supposed to be these ornamental things. So, of course, once the women aren't looking like that anymore, and there's plenty of younger women that will maybe take up with the same guy. Um, women are in a really bad situation as they get older. So it's very, it's hard. I mean, I think that, you know, it's frustrating on one hand because you want to tell the girl, like, come on, wake up, you know, go do something on your own. but. Um, women are really bred from birth to be dependent on men and you know like I was really raised with this, this uh, mentality like my family I remember so many times when my extended family would come and just say oh you're so pretty you should never have to work and you know just this idea that if I just stayed pretty that some man would take care of me and you know that's a really um, it's like whacking the <laughs> feet off their daughter I mean it's it's really not a good way to to raise girls, but th that's still very prevalent from what I can see everywhere. So, in some ways, this is a silly question since you are doing it with your, you know, with your writing. But so, how do how do how do we how does how do you how does one in general um, change how do we change that? How do we make it so that 30 years from now, women, 30 years from now, people aren't having the same conversation and raising their daughters the same way? What needs to happen? Yeah, I think that's a really, really critical question. Um, well, <laughs> I hope that it's, you know, for me, I had to have like radical things happen to me to like wake me up. But I think that... Um, with our daughters that we, we have to raise them in a radical way and in a radically different way. You know, you can't just keep raising girls the same way and expect things to be different. And, um, you know, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a long question, but I mean, I will say there's other, pla you know, I've recently moved to Norway. I mean, the dip, the, they don't, they don't uh, differentiate as much here between, um, 
boys and girls, and I think that that's a really positive thing. You still see, um, you know, in the United States, you really start separating the sexes. You know, I saw it, I think, with my kids around the ages of five or six. And before that, you know, they could have boy and girlfriends, and they were all together. And after that, it was like the boys are here and the girls are here. Um, now that I'm in Norway, I see kids playing at least until my son's 12, so I can't really say so much after that. But I do see more mixing of the sexes, and I think that that is actually a really good and important thing. Um, I think just all the ways that we assign gender, like right away with the pink clothes and the blue clothes, and um, I mean, it's just, it's so many different things. Um, so it's, it's really, you have to look at everything, I think, and kind of just turn it upside down and shake it all out and start over. And how has been your your experience with your daughter of um, helping her to find the you know the the girl god inside of her and to see that divine feminine and then to on the playground run into boys saying you know God's a man and therefore I'm I'm better than you or something. How well, how has been her social laughs experience? Them, actually, because she's my daughter is so strong. Um, and I I raised her like to be so strong sometimes that I wonder like, okay, did I go a little too far? <laughs> but um but no, I mean she's she's very tough. She has no problem. I mean, it took me till my mid thirties to be able to, you know, I'd never had an argument with my father my entire life. I'd never actually told him how I felt about anything. I mean, that's how deep the socialization goes. So I think it's very important to raise girls even when it's uncomfortable because we're not used to, and you know, I see this reaction from people a lot. We're not used to having girls tell people their perceptions of things. I don't think a lot of people are ready for the honest perceptions of girls. People are very used to girls still being very passive and submissive. And it, it can be uncomfortable because when you raise a daughter to be strong, she's going to say things sometimes that you don't really like um, or that other people don't really like. And she may act in ways that are not, you know, ladylike or, you know, how people think that girls should behave. But then, you know, if you put it, you know, especially for me, since I have the, the son and the daughter, if you put it, if you think about it through like the same situations, okay, well, what if my son did this? then yeah, that would be socially acceptable. So I think we really have to kind of think very deeply about how we're raising children and, you know, if something seems uncomfortable to assign another gender to it and say, okay, well, would it be okay if a boy did this instead of a girl? And usually the answer is yes. So that that seems like a very powerful tool that anybody can pick up in their own lives. Well, I hope so. Um, so, have you met, and we may talk about what resistance to your work on, on some of your other work, but has there been any significant resistance to uh, your work with children this way? I mean, have have you had, um, I don't know, upset religious people telling you that you're doing a bad thing, or has the response been primarily positive? Um, I would say it's been primarily positive. Um, we, you, I have a um, illustrator partner here in Norway, um, Elizabeth Sletness, who's wonderful. Um, and when we first met, um, we kind of joked that, you know, someone was going to kill us over this. Um, but there has, you know, every once in a while I'll get a random death threat, but it, it's nothing serious. Um, and yeah, I mean, on my Facebook page, sometimes we get people that just put weird Bible verses and, you know, think that they're trying to save us, but I'm not too bothered about that. I mean, Facebook is a strange <laughs> place anyway, so you get random comments no matter what you're doing. So what do you see as the, what would you like to see um, next in terms of a, not specifically with your work, but with um, sort of a larger movement to 
uh, revivify the goddess? What, how would you like to see society move forward in some sort of, um, you know, presuming that we don't all wake up tomorrow with some sort of epiphany, how would you like to see that social transformation take place? Well, I see it taking place with women, and I, I see, I, I, I think things have rapidly changed in the last three or four years. I think a lot of women are waking up to the divine feminine. I, I think that we have to be careful because there's connotations with the goddess of, you know, this hypersexualized, uh, again, like kind of, um, and that, that was kind of some of the things like I had to overcome with my work is a lot of people think of goddess as like this woo-woo uh, sexualized, you know, kind of like almost like superhero figure with big boobs. That you know, I mean, they have so many goddess figures. If you if you look if you look up goddess, the images of the goddesses are not really what I would consider to be like empowered women. But um, in any case, um, I think that women are waking up to the goddess, and I think when women demand their rights and take them, because I, I believe that we should all have the same abilities and, and whatnot in our lifetime. We shouldn't have to beg people to give us rights. Um, then I think men will start to, to wake up as well. And, and what, sorry if this is too basic of a question, but so what is the relationship between, between Demanding your rights. I, what is the relationship between the goddess work and demanding your rights? Because I'm guessing that there are a lot of people who are um, who advocate for a, a lot of women who advocated for women's suffrage, who may not have specifically believed in a goddess, and there are probably some people who believe in in a goddess who are completely apolitical. So how do you bring those? How do you um, how do you use those to mutually reinforce? Well, um, I don't have a quote in front of me, but Z, Z Budapest has a quote that I really like that basically says, without the goddess feminism, feminism isn't going to work because you basically burn out. You know, you have to have a, a spiritual component to your work. And I, I find that because it's, feminism is very exhausting. I think any sort of, like, social activism can be very exhausting. Um and I don't think that everybody has to be spiritual or, like, believe in the goddess. I mean, I think that's a totally personal thing. But I think just this possibility for women to embrace something outside of what, we're being, what we've been taught our entire life. Because I think the uh, patriarchal religions have a, a very strong hold on these, most people, even if they don't think that they do. You know, most people will go to a, a wedding or, I mean, all these different... Uh, religious ceremonies, you still end up going even if you're not a religious person. So I think finding new symbols is really important for women, especially if they, you know, identify with them personally. Um, I think that there are goddesses like Kali that are very fiery and passionate, and that's where I'm kind of coming in here with like this demanding your rights, because I think a lot of women still don't really at their core believe that they deserve those rights. I think that we've been really socialized for so long since, you know, infancy that that we are secondary, that, you know, even if you believe on an intellectual level that you're not, on a subconscious level, most women are still acting out of this small space that we've been allotted. Well, I think that that's really important work that you're doing. Um, what are you, what, what are your... What are your plans for future work? Do you have do you have other books you're working on right now? Yeah, well, I have I have about ten that I have on my schedule, but um, I have some really cool projects that I'm working on right now that I'm excited about. Um, one is uh, an, another anthology, and it's called Jesus, Muhammad, and the Goddess, and it's um, it's two things. It's it's the divine feminine within Islam and Christianity but it's also women that have left those traditions in, to find the goddess. And um, the contributors in there are fantastic. It's, it's going to be a really great anthology. Um, and I've had some criticism, like, why do we have to have these two dudes in the, 
in the title, you know, just have the goddess. But I think people will actually be surprised with the amount of critique in the book, and um, it, it's going to be a really great book. Um, the second thing that I'm working on is actually a reprogramming guide um, for women, and I'm working on it with an artist, Arna Bart, and um, we will announce more of the details later, but I'm really excited about that because it's kind of some of what we're talking about. It's like the undoing of the socialization that we're given. Um, and not it's not a traditional like self-help type work box. We're, we're calling it actually a toolbox. Um, it's gonna have a lot of like radical feminist quotes and like solid things that will actually help women to kind of reprogram their brains. Um, like, without giving too much away, I mean, can you give an example of that? One example? Um, <laughs> um, well, I'm trying to think of a specific example because my mind is going all over the place. Um, I wasn't actually even going to bring up that one yet. Um, yeah, I think you'll have to wait and see. I think we'll announce it in about three weeks. And um, it, it will be a really cool, I'll send you a copy when we, when we have it up. Okay, that sounds great. So if you, if you, um, if they can make you the, the, the queen of all things of raising children, uh, what would you want a couple things for mothers and fathers around the world to do to raise their children? children uh, such that their daughters are no longer subservient? Well, it's a hard question because it's very difficult to raise children right now, I think, and especially, you know, for someone like me, I've been mostly a single mom, um, it's very hard to raise a strong daughter when you're also being, you know, basically abused every day with the system. Um, but, you know, in my ideal world, first of all, mothers and fathers would have support, you know, from their entire community because I think that's really important. Um, not only, you know, more government support and everything, but family support, grandmothers are so important, hugely important. Aunties, everybody, I mean, my friends in my life that don't have children that are women especially have been aunties to my children and that's, that's really important um, because I think to raise kids you have to have that strong foundation especially if you don't have um, now I have a wonderful partner but in the past I didn't really have a great partner or any help with that so but the second thing I would say is that we have to allow children to have their own emotional autonomy and I think that's really important for both boys and for girls because um, and that's one of the reasons I did the book for boys too, because we don't really allow boys to have their emotions and their feelings. And, and you know, going back to this, the difference between boys and girls, we raise them very different. So just the way that we kind of put girls into this one category, we also put boys into the far opposite. And, um, and I think if we want to have a better future, we have to equally consider how we're raising boys. Um, and both of them could benefit from having um, the divine feminine in their lives. So just allowing children to, uh, from my perspective, a lot of people don't allow children to have emotions. It's kind of like not convenient, <laughs> you know, to have these. I have very lively, spirited children, and that's not very popular. You know, people still have this idea of we want children to be seen and not heard. And I think children should be heard because in my mind, children have, creative solutions to things, you know, especially environment, all these different things that maybe we're not even thinking of. So maybe we should be listening to children more and allowing them to have their freedoms and ups and downs and, you know, all of it. You know, I think it's all wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on the program, and I would like to thank listeners for listening. My guest today has been Trista Hendren. This is Derek Jensen for Resistance Radio on the Progressive Radio Network.